Good morning, everybody. My name is Chen Xuan Lin, and today I'm going to talk about our work, Inverse Compositional Spatial Transformer Networks. This work was done with Simon Lucy at Carnegie Mellon University. So suppose that we have a visual recognition problem to solve. Steadily, our computer vision algorithms would probably involve training neural networks. And suppose that we, today that we want to do a classification task. We typically fit in a lot of the training data and hope that the network will learn something meaningful and representable of the data. But if we look at the training data, we will find that there are a lot of the variation, not only in terms of the appearance, but also the spatial locations and the geometric deformations. So how might we learn to achieve some sort of a spatial invariance within neural networks, such as to increase the robustness of our algorithms? So one typical way we would do is by data augmentation. Basically, we perturb the data geometrically, and we hope that the network will learn to absorb these perturbations. However, the drawback is that it cannot focus on learning the similar semantics with respect to spatial locations. The second type of operations that we would typically do is by spatial pooling. This, um, this operation typically reduces the image dimensions to learn higher level representations but it also destroys the details of cement for sem semantic understanding, and it has a very limited range and type of toleration. So we could definitely learn to tolerate these spatial variations implicitly, but we will require a huge increase on model parameters to learn these um, tolerations. Whereas if we could achieve some sort of alignment across data, we will be able to de design a lot more efficient algorithms. And this is a very well-known and widely applied concept in the vision and learning community. So um, in order not to uh, tolerate these spatial variations inefficiently, what we could do is to resolve spatial um, these spatial variations explicitly. So given the input image, one thing we could do is to predict some, um, some parameters for the, um, for the geometric transformations. So we can feed in uh, the image into a subnetwork, which we call the geometric predictor, to predict some parameters for the geometric, um, geometric warp. And we use, use these, um, um, warp, um, this geometric transformation to warp the input image, which is fed, uh, subsequently fed inside um, the, um, the subsequent network, such as uh, for classification. And it has also been shown that this kind of warp function has a, uh, has a differentiable expression, and it allows bad, pro bad propagation for gradients within a deep learning framework. And this is also known as spatial transformer networks. And, and the uh, key idea of spatial transformer networks is that it learns to resolve these spatial variations instead of just tolerating them. And it has been widely applied to a number of discriminative tasks, or better, uh, just learning some better representations. So let's now look at some of the um, drawbacks of spatial transform networks, also known as STNs. So first of all, the uh, spatial transform networks has, uh, has an effect which we call the boundary effect. So what is the boundary effect? If we fit inside a crop region of interest of this image inside an STN, and if, it, if the geometric predictor learns to predict some zoom-in transformations, STNs will have no problem doing that because it just basically zooms the image in. However, if STN would learn to zoom out the image, we will see that it has a boundary effect because it is unable to recover the information from the original image. So the original ge geometric information is not preserved um, within the network because the image is propagated, not the geometric P. The second drawback of STNs is that it always, always predicts a single transformation in one go which means that it always predicts a very large, a possibly very large displacement from appearance, and it is very difficult to do that. So why is that? Consider this toy image um, here and this bounding box. If we want to predict a smaller displacement uh, from this green bounding box, we can see from a different image that it is fairly easy to figure out how, how we should move this bounding box just by looking at a different image. However, if we want to predict a fairly larger displacement from this uh, pink bounding box, we see that there is a much higher linearity between the difference image and the spatial displacement. 
And this is because that uh, there is a strong appearance correlation between nearby pixels. But this relationship actually drops down with larger distances. And this is actually a very fundamental problem in computer vision. But it's actually been already been addressed 35 years ago by the classical algorithm called the Lucas Kanade algorithm. So what does the Lucas Kanade algorithm tell us? If we have a source image I here, and we want to, and we have a template in image T to align against, Lucas Kanade, um, we basically want to find the best geometric deformation, such that it warps the source image and it minimizes the photometric error between the source image I and the template image T. So the Lucas Kanade algorithm linear, linearizes uh, this objective function to be uh, to be least square solvable. And also that um, uh, the, the main idea of behind this algorithm is that it tries to solve for this warp update iteratively until some convergence is reached. So this is basically just Gauss-Newton optimization. And if we look at the closed form solution of this objective function, we can see that it actually just establishes an approximate linear relationship between the appearance i in a geomet geometry delta p. And we can see that R and B here, which is the um, recursive and the bias term, are actually a function of the warp estimate P, which means that um, the current estimate of the linear model depends on the current warp P. And after it's updated, we have to re-estimate the linear regressor uh, or the linear model over again. So the, LK the downside of this al LK algorithm is that we need to compute this, uh, recompute the linear models over and over again. And it's, uh, it's always dependent on this warp, um, warp state P. Now, there is a, ver a variant of this al algorithm proposed in 2004, which is called the inverse compositional Lucas Kanade algorithm. So what is the central idea of inverse compositional LK is very close to the uh, original LK, but there's a slight modification in the objective function. So we can also linearize this objective function into this form, and, also, and also has a least squares um, closed form solution. But uh, what it does is that it actually solves for the warp update on the template image, and then inversely compose it to the source image. And it also and, um, repeats this process over and over again until convergence is also reached. So it's very similar to the original LK algorithm. However, if we look at this closed form solution, we can see that this linear model doesn't depend on P anymore. It is static, and which means that we only actually only need a single linear model for successful, successful iterative alignment. This, is, uh, this has a very high, uh, high advantage in terms of uh, com uh, computational complexity um, in applications such as um, tracking. So how can we use this concept to help spatial transport networks? Well, this is the original form of uh, STM that we just saw. So we could, um, given that we if we have an uh, initial estimate of the warp P in here, we can warp the image here, fit into the geometric predictor to predict a warp update. We compose the um, warp uh, parameters together, and then we pass it down over um, for the subsequent network. So we can see that. Um, the original image is always preserved. It's it is never destroyed, and the geometry is always preserved. And by that, we eliminate the boundary effect. And we can also see that this kind of module is also concatenable, which means that we can concatenate this kind of module over uh, multiple times to form um, this kind of um, uh, alignment framework. And we can see that this, is ha this is a, has a very high analogy to the Lucas Kanade algorithm that we just saw. So um, since that it doesn't predict single transformations anymore, um, we can see that uh, it also allows area of alignment. However, um, we just saw from the inverse conventional OK that we only actually need a single model for this kind of successful uh, um, alignment. So how can we apply this concept to, um, to the, to the to the improved spatial transformer network that we just had. Well, 
we could roll up this kind of uh, iterative alignment framework and make it a recurrent version. So this is, has a very high analogy to the inverse conventional LK algorithm. We only need a single model to uh, iteratively predict the geometric uh, update. And we use the same model over and over again, and then we and feed it to the uh, subsequent network. So this has a third advantage of re predicting recurrent spatial transformations. And this is the final formulation of our proposed inverse compositional spatial tra transform network. So in our experiments, uh, we compare against three kind of architectures. We have a baseline CNN, we have an NSTN, and we have ICSTN. For CNN and SDN, we perturb the images and crop the region of interest to feed inside the networks. Whereas in ICSTN, we, keep or, or we always keep the original image, and we always compose the um, ge geometric updates. And we design the baseline CNNs and the SDN and ICSTN to have roughly the same number of layers and the same number of learnable parameters. And we also denote the suffix for ICSTN uh, for the number of recurrence transformations that is learned. So we can uh, take a look at uh, some of the results on MNIST. Um, we can look at STN first, where uh, this is the input uh, of STN, that STN sees. And this is the transformation that it has learned. We can see that uh, it is not a, a complete digit, digit. They are not complete digits anymore because of the boundary effect. Whereas in ICSTN4, um, since it always um, preserves the original image, we can see from the alignment process from iteration number one, um, the second iteration, the third, and the fourth. So we can see that uh, it is able to draw back the information from the original image and you completely use those information to, um, to align across the data set. And we can look at, also look at the main appearance um, across the data set. So this is the original appearance um, sorry, the appearance from the original data set. And this is the mean taken from the perturbed versions that the network sees. These are the um, mean appearance that STN and ICSTN see. So we can see that ICSTN, um, for ICSTN4, where it is learned with more numbers of recurrent transformations, the mean gets sharper, which means that uh, better alignment is achieved. And we can also look at the variance of, this, um, of the ICSCN4. And we can see that uh, variance is greatly reduced, and the digits become more hollow, which means that um, this is another indicator of um, better alignment. And, this is, and we can also uh, see from the uh, STN variance, we can see that it is actually um, it is not as hollow as um, the IC, ICSTN variance. And we can look at the classification error. We can see that um, we can see we can see there is a benefit from trading alignment capacity for classification capacity. And we can um, furthermore we can see that I, since ICSTN eliminates the boundary effects, it, it is able to achieve um, better classification error. And if it's learned with more recurrent transformations, it is better to, um, it is able to push the performance even further. Now we can look, look at some more challenging data sets, such as traffic sign classification. And this is the uh, transformation uh, that the networks has learned. So we can see that um, SDN still has the boundary effect over there. And we, if we look at the mean appearance, we can see that uh, SDSCN also learns um, to align the, um, the traffic signs together pretty well, um, better than SDN and the original CNNs. And we, especially for the um, speed limit signs, where you can see that 30 and 80 are a lot more sharper. And the classification error that we get is consistent with the results that we have from MNIST. So what does indi this indicate? This suggests that we might be able to use a very cheap detector to detect a very um, rough estimate of the location for the traffic sign. And we can use ICSCDN to align and classify, um, to, to a lot better align the uh, traffic sign and then to, um, to use a very, also a very cheaper, cheaper classifier to um, align the digits and jointly classify the traffic signs together. So um, in summary, uh, we established a theoretical connection between um, SDN and, and LK. And we, and we um, advocate that um, tolerating spatial variations is very inefficient 
and resolving these spatial variables explicitly is um, is a lot more eff uh, efficient by predicting iterative small um, warp updates. Uh, please come to our poster for more in-depth discussions. Thank you very much.